Yes, Mr Handy. Thank you, my Lord. I <clears throat> was moving on to issue two, ground nine as it is now, and I've got three points to make. I'm afraid they're not covered in my skeleton argument um, for the Court of Appeal, which this permission was yeah. not granted, but there are two documents which set them out in writing. Mm -hmm. The first is in the core bundle tab four, our paragraph 19.1 statement. And on page 50, uh, paragraph 12. Yeah. I think uh, the court looked at this right at the start of the hearing. So my first point is that made in the first sentence there, which is that issue two is parasitic on issue one and must fail, therefore, for the reasons I've already given. Um, uh, and the reference to the skeleton argument instead of Paris 60 is now paragraph 60, uh, 56, sorry, 56 of the appellant's appeal statement. The second point is then that made uh, in the rest of that paragraph. And again, if I may, I'll update the reference in line 3 from paragraph 71 to paragraph 67. But I say there that that's based on a false premise because the, the policies, as it were, don't need rescuing. The absence of a five-year housing land supply does not make policies out of date. Policies are deemed to be out of date only for the purposes of triggering 11D via footnote 7. The question of whether the policies are substantively out of date is a different question. Uh, and this it is addressed in the second document I asked the court to look at, which is our um, skeleton argument from the High Court. Mm. That's tab 13, page 211. Paragraph 72 there is the, the, this second. where I say three lines up from the bottom, the deeming via footnote 7 is simply to engage paragraph 11d and footnote 7 does not go further. The case law on that is set out earlier in my skeleton argument, page 204 in the bundle, paragraph 43, where I say in the second sentence, paragraph 213 is relevant to paragraph 11d in judging whether the most important policies are out of date. And there's a... If something is deemed to be out of date, it can't actually be out of date. It, it's being treated as out of date for a purpose. It, therefore, it is, it's not out of date. It's not out of date, that's right, my lady, by that deeming mechanism. Yes. There's then a separate question. Is it out which of is, date? Is it out of date in substance? Yeah. Um, my Lord, Lord Justice Limblom's judgment in Bloor Holmes, for example, at paragraph 45, says that one of the ways in which a policy can be substantively out of date is whether it's been overtaken by a change in national right. policy. And you judge whether it's been overtaken by a change in national policy by looking at paragraph 213. Certainly that's the main way of dealing with that. Um, to ask whether it's consistent with current national policy. Um, and in footnote 22 to my skeleton argument in the High Court, um, I cite the Wavenden case and the Peel Investments case. Now Peel has since been heard by this court and upheld in September. But those are the cases that, that say effectively paragraph 213 is the, the means by which you test whether policy is out of date because it's been overtaken by policy changes. Uh, and then the, the third submission that I make, to go back, if I may, to page 211 of the bundle, is that set out in paragraph 73 to 75 of my High Court skeleton argument. I'll just ask the Court to note that. Sorry, which paragraphs again? Uh, 73 to 75 my Lord, on pages 211 and 212 of the bundle. Yeah. So that's where the argument is, but it's best addressed perhaps by actually looking at the Corby decision letter, 
which is um, behind tab 21. Mm. It's starting on page 329 at the bottom. This is the inspector, as we saw before in paragraph 52, identifying conflict with the development plan's overarching locational strategy. And then going on to say the weight to be given to that conflict is reduced because there's no five year housing land supply, albeit the inspector noting no. the shortfall is not significant. So then we come to the paragraph that's relevant on ground nine, which is paragraph 53. Uh, and we can see from the first line of paragraph 53, this is considering another argument being advanced by the appellant. It says the appellant contends the JCS is also out of date and goes on to consider that. So that was being advanced as another reason why the weight to the conflict with the spatial strategy could be reduced, i.e. because the JCS was substantively out of date. Uh, and the inspector considers that by saying the acid test of weight to a policy, any conflict in such circumstances, is the degree of consistency with the framework. And in my submission, that reference is perfectly lawful and in line with the case law Wavenden and Peel, as I identified earlier. The inspector says the policies before me are consistent with the framework for the reasons given by the examining inspector only three years ago. So in my submission, the inspector is right to test whether the JCS is out of date by considering the degree of consistency with the MPPS, and it's not seeking to bring back the, the policy from being out of date, both because substantively um, it, it's not out of date because there's only a small shortfall, paragraph 52, but also paragraph 53 because it's consistent with the NPPS. So this is the inspector in 53 considering and rejecting another argument as to why the plan was substantively out of date. And in my submission, the degree of consistency of a policy in the development plan with the NPPF is the right way of considering whether a policy is out of date because it's been overtaken by later national policy. So there is nothing objectionable about what was done in paragraph 53 when read in context in light of the case law, in particular Wavenden and Peel following law home. So that was everything that I wanted to say on issue uh, two, ground nine. Um, just checking if I made my emails to see if there's any instructions from clients and nothing has come through. So, um, my laws, my lady, those are my submissions unless I can assist the court with anything. Thank you very much, Mr. Nick. Okay. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Kimden. Six-page document that arrived this morning. this morning, and that's a reply. That's the comprehensive reply, is it? That, that's the reply to what we heard uh, yesterday, yeah. and I have two initial comments and essentially five further points. Okay. All right. So you'll you'll take that as read. We have already uh, read it. It will, of course, be read thoroughly in due course. Um, but you can you can rely on us digesting it in that way if you're content. I'm very good. And you want to add five points? Five points. But I, before I get to my five points, I just want to say by way of overview, and as much for the Secretary of State to take on board, as much for the court. 
what we say this case is about. Two points are these. Firstly, it's no part of the appellant's case, either on the facts or the issue, the main issue. To address the way in which we deal with up-to-date development plans. I make that first overarching comment because quite a lot of what we've heard today has in fact been about up-to-date development plans, not what it's about. And secondly, to make it absolutely clear that our case fully respects the development plan and the priority to be accorded to it, which has occupied a very substantial part of what has been submitted today. And I'll refer back to those two points, two in the course of my five points, which I want to make. Now, the first refers to this question of up-to-date. And we had some more submissions early on today about paragraph 12. And further emphasis on the question of the development plan led to this. The point that I want to emphasize is that we are here occupied with a development plan system which is not delivering or has nothing relevant to say. And in our submission, the policies in the framework are to be understood in that light. Of course, promoting and emphasizing the importance of the up-to-date plan and respecting it in decision-making. But who's the judge of whether a development plan has something relevant to say or not? You say once it's deemed out of date by reference to housing supply, that's it. It has nothing relevant to say. In the 11D2 question. Yes. But my second overarching point is that the development plan, in most cases, will have a lot which is relevant to say, which must be taken into account in the decision. But it's not taken into account in 11D2. The assessment is not against the policies in the development plan. It is against the policies in the framework, which is alluding to my fourth point. Because what we're concerned with is, on our submission, a material consideration which is either going to be displaced by 11D2 or not. That's at the heart of our case. We're not concerned with 11D2 becoming essential to the whole of the decision-making process. All that it does, all that 11D does, is create a material consideration. And picking up my lady's point, turning to my second point, as to the distinction between development plan policies and framework policies, so far as the framework helps us. My learned friend took us through very many policies in the framework. I want to just pick up on two personally. We had local green space, and we had green belt. And those, it was explained to the court, required the development plan in order to be able to essentially apply the framework policy. But no explanation was given as to footnote six, because both of those 
our fourth node stick is policy, and we, which we know from exploring it extensively in this case. Secretary of State has explained development plan not in favour. So, no, that, that wasn't grappled with by the Secretary of State. I draw attention to that. But really, that then leads to my third point in reply, and that is focusing upon the question which my lady, Lady Justice Simler, asked about whether it's possible to apply these framework policies absent the development plan. And that's one of the reasons why I emphasise what this case is about. What we're concerned with is an assessment against the policies in the framework. Now, of course, it is eminently possible and indeed a requirement that there be assessment against the policies in the development plan. But it is not correct to say that one cannot assess the effect, the impacts and benefits, as against the framework, but for these reasons. Sorry, just the last proposition again, fully. I missed, I think, part of the sentence. Not correct to say that it is impossible. Yes. To assess against the framework absent the development plan. Right. Because the debate here is about policy. And I, I draw attention now to the proposals map. The proposals map with a development plan is not a policy. It is a map, which is, as a matter of fact, it is not examined by an examining inspector. Out of the curiosity of a, an examination. So ask the question, do you need the development plan policies in respect of Greenbelt to find out where the Greenbelt is? Answer, no, you don't. But that might not be a complete answer to all of the many points that were made by my learned friend. Part of them. Next, 11D2 isn't like some sort of question of admissibility in a criminal case where once, once something becomes inadmissible, you must shutter off your mind and it's completely irrelevant to anything else you're ever thinking about. The evidence, the materials which one has in respect of the application are the foundation of the assessment against the policies in the framework. And that's the focus. Which set of policies are you going to use? And there is inevitably, in any case of any complexity, the evidence available to deal with matters which my learned friend dealt with. I'm not going to go through each and every one. That would be rather tedious. But, but are you saying that, in effect, what is in the development plan will come out in some of the other materials and that will all form part of the inspector's assessment? I don't, I don't quite understand what you're saying. It's, is that that's you're essentially, it's essentially correct. Um, because, to take the example of uh, rural housing needs, in any such case, um, if that's relied upon in respect of the affordable element of a particular scheme, that might be said to be a benefit. One is going to assess that against the up-to-date evidence. And that might be picked up from the evidence base through the relevant plan. But that does not remotely mean that one needs to go anywhere near the policies which set out the criteria in respect of that particular issue. Now, it can properly be said that the exercise 
as against the national policies, they being will be an exercise which is a broader brush. But it certainly can be done. And what I um, detect is a, is a um, I may be wrong, but I, I detect a concern that something will be left out and that the decision being made will be imperfect as a result or not what it should be. And that's why I made the point that the appellant's case fully respects the priority to be given to the development of the plan. Of course, the decision maker must fully and anxiously consider the development plan, the relevant development plan policy, and come to, come to a conclusion in that regard. Using those policies, And if the material consideration in 11D2, sorry, if the material consideration in 11D remains in play after going through 11D1 and going through 11D2, the conclusion on the development plan will be weighed against all the other material considerations, including the material consideration, which is that the Secretary of State says, in this case, In this case, a grant of permission is what national policy indicates, which is all of the cases we've looked at go on to say that is not something the decision maker is driven to, it's something which the other material considerations and the extent of the lack of accordance with the development plan, for example, may overcome in a particular so nothing is left out. It is not our case that the development plan is ignored. So that's really picking up my lady Judith Potter's point. Uh, which brings me to my fourth point as to two stage not necessary. My learned friend's heading was concerned with two-stage approach, which is said that we contend for, and it, uh, the Secretary of State says that's not necessary, so we can reject his conclusion. Now, as to the uh, agreed legal propositions, uh, they are accurate. All that they indicate, and all that Mr. David Elvin When one comes in a 11D2 case to do this exercise of looking at policies against adverse effect and impact, one can go about that in a variety of ways dependent upon the facts of the case, per Lord Clive, when Lord Clive was referring to the development plan. It is no suggestion that in an 11D case, one can appropriately ga simply gather together all of the material by way of a general study. It would be an inappropriate case under 11D. Sorry, can you formulate the submission again for me? For us? Um, my Lord, in a paragraph, most certainly. Yeah, in a um, paragraph 11D, you meant 11D case. Yes. In the paragraph 11D case, yeah. so just to be absolutely clear where one of the three routes into it is in play, then when one comes to look, when the decision maker comes to 11D2, <coughs> that process of assessment against the policies in the framework can be undertaken in any way which is suitable not prescribed. That is the analogy with Lord Clive and the City of Edinburgh. But also per Wyndham and other cases, in an 11D case, it 
which is necessary. We make a finding as to compliance with the relevant plan or not. Well, uh, just pausing. Pause. I just want the proposition. When one comes to paragraph 11D, process of assessment can be undertaken. What do you submit? In any way which is convenient to the particular case. What you're, what, what you're saying is the 11D2 stage can be done in I whatever am. way uh, the decision maker thinks yeah. best for the case, yes. and that's what Lord Clyde was talking about. Yes. But you're saying there is a staged approach before you get to 11D2, I yes. think. It has my, to be. my lady has the point exactly. That's my submission. Right, well, we'll certainly go back and look at what Lord Clyde actually said. Well, can I? Um, it wasn't an invitation, so. Um, no, mine wasn't either. Um, we will look at what Lord no. Clyde says, which is the law. My Lord, uh, I was at cross purposes. Uh, uh, I wasn't saying I was making an invitation, I was referring to what my Lord was saying, whether or not that was an invitation to go to the City of Edinburgh. By all means, go to the City of Edinburgh to see what the law is. Yes, but because uh, if, it's, if it's a matter of concern to the court, it's important that I address it. Well, I, the, court, the court has already been taken there and reminded itself of what Lord Clyde actually said. But by all means, let's do it again. So, 056, page 56, is the start of the uh, Lord Clyde's And the relevant uh, and familiar material starts at page 60. And uh, the submission of the Secretary of State, which was uh, rejected, is at 61 at H. Two distinct stages. And over the page, I, I imagine this is what my Lord had in mind. Well, it starts, doesn't it? it uh, in the penultimate line on page 61. Yes. 1459 of the report. But in my view, it is undesirable to devise any universal prescription for the method to be adopted by the decision maker, provided always, of course, that he does not act out with his powers, etc. And then he goes on a little later to refer to the two-stage approach suggested by counsel at B on page 1460. Do you take issue with any of that? Not at all. No, I, I, I uh, entirely rely upon it. It's, right. it's uh, so well established in respect of right. the development plan and the point which Seeking to uh, make submissions about is mm -hmm. as to the analogous use of that part of the law which relates to development plan when carrying out an assessment by reference to the policies in the framework, which I'm contending with this law. is essentially our point four on our written reply. And in that written reply, we say we still don't understand what the Secretary of State is saying in terms of the application And in our submission, we're still no further forward in understanding exactly what it is said 
House Commission the position which the Secretary of State, the analysis which the Secretary of State has done results in an outcome which is uh, confusing and confused as to the way in which the development plan and the decision on accordance with the development plan integrates with that particular part of the framework, whereas our analysis perfectly integrates with that. Can I just ask you to clarify um, the warning in the penultimate paragraph on page three of your written reply, where you tell us that this is dangerous territory it is. for both the Secretary of State and the court to enter. Um, that's the warning. I, are you submitting to us or not, Mr. Kinvin, that government guidance cannot lawfully guide the decision maker on the performance of his statutory task. I'm not. Thank you. That's all I have to ask you. The uh, upshot of That exercise will in part be dependent upon what is done in respect of paragraph 212, at least for my last slide. What you uh, heard in respect of paragraph 213 was uh, quite a lot of reference to consistency, which of course is right. Deals with. But as my uh, Lord, Lord Justice Lynn Bonner just adverted to, the question of weight is something which, for forever and a day, uh, national policy has borne upon. In respect of 213, in respect of 213, it's important in my submission not to be distracted by the emphasis on consistency, and to then leave out of account, it's highly relevant in these, on the facts of these two cases, the effect of the absence of a five-year land supply. Because that is something upon which that's really the foundation of in Hopkins, in paragraph 49 of the former framework. And the, the difficulty which arises in the Breton case is that what the inspector does is say, by reason of consistency of the plan with the framework, because it was, it was examined only three years ago, That is, in effect, a trump card that, as he said, at acid test. That has the effect of trumping that particular piece of advice. And in our submission, that's, that's not the correct approach. What he's doing, what he ought to be doing, of consistency uh, is looking at uh, the consistency of policies in the development plan for the provision of housing, consistency with the requirement for five year land supply, and adjusting the weight accordingly. The broad consistency of the whole of the plan, which is what the examining inspector is doing, doesn't help. So just, just to follow that through, he, he should say to himself that um, there's a, a shortfall uh, in relation to the five-year policy, and therefore it's inconsistent. Yes. So there's a conflict. Yes. Then what does he do? Then he, then he adjusts the weight to um, 
policies which deal with those issues. And you mean adjusts the weight? You mean he puts that to one side? No, I don't go as far. It's never been my okay. case that it's disregard. Okay. So, so what do you mean adjusts the weight? Um, D does he does he look at how sh how big the shortfall is, or uh, does he it, look it, at the contextual factors, or does he just say it's it's in conflict? Uh, he arrive at a uh, typically a decision maker will arrive at a conclusion that they're going to give uh, a little moderate or substantial weight to and uh, describe the weight they're going to give uh, to policies in that sort of way right. and, and uh, it might, if it's full weight uh, then of course uh, that's not an adjustment so what, what's happening here is that there is a, a confusion between the question of consistency with the development plan vision and what should be going on in respect of the fact that we've got a land supply which is less than five years. That's, what's, that's the confusion that's happening in that paragraph. And it's having the, and it feeds through to uh, his conclusion as to, as to uh, displacing uh, the presumption. So I hope in that way, by that uh, uh, last and fifth point, uh, I've been able to show in some way the, what, the way in which they, those two things should relate to each other and what in fact happened in uh, Breton, which was uh, issue two before, before the judge below. Uh, as I say, the remaining points in the reply are very great. submissions both in writing and uh, orally at the hearing. Uh, thank you too for your forbearance in the present um, restrictions for such hearings as these. We're very grateful to you, all of you, and those who aren't here but who've assisted you. Um, we shall reserve our judgment and hand that down in due course. In the meantime, as, as normally, we shall provide a draft of it or typographical or minor factual corrections only. The order should be agreed beforehand down, and upon that basis, there will be no need for attendance when judgment is finally handed down. Thank you. And what may I say, I hope without any uh, impertinence, that we, uh, on behalf of the bar, that we too are grateful for the unity and the cooperation in these cases. Thank you, Mr. Kimden. That is, that is noted. And um, we'll be born in mind. Thank you.